kind of schizophrenic type of attendance at these meetings. <laughs> I'm Jay Sutliff. I'm a faculty member here in the Health Sciences Department, and uh, this is Wendy Wetzel, nurse practitioner from the HLC Health Clinic. She'll be our presenter tonight. But uh, welcome to our meeting. We've been having monthly meetings. We're getting geared up to maybe do another study in the spring. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And we're glad you're here. Uh, Wendy's going to talk about good bugs, bad bugs, and microbes and so forth in the stomach and the rest of the GI tract. And then we'll get into some other things that we have planned afterwards. So, one informal, one. Yeah. Okay. So, Wendy, I'll. Here's the slide. It's right here. Okay. I found the slide thingy. Okay. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Yep. Can everyone, do we need to turn lights down at all, or can you kind of I can see do this? what, front row? Do the front row, that yeah. might be easier. Okay, as Jay said, um, I'm a nurse practitioner. I'm coming up on my 45th year of nursing practice, and my last. <laughs> Retirement, June 30th. Um, and about 30 years as a nurse practitioner. And I've always been interested in alternative health. Um, my, actually, my national certification is in holistic nursing not in cardiovascular or anything else, it's in holistic nursing. So this really fits in. And as about, oh my gosh, many years ago, I really moved to a vegetarian diet, and I couldn't, I really couldn't eat meat when I was pregnant with my son. It just made me sicker than a dog. And there's family stories about that, but I won't share those tonight. Um, so over time, I got more and more interested in nutrition, and then about three and a half years ago, um, I watched um, Forks Over Knives. And that absolutely changed my life. And I had a partner in crime, and we would have each other over for dinner and say, I'm making page 42, but we wouldn't say what cookbook it was. Mm. And so we experimented on each other for, oh my gosh, we still experiment on each other. Um, and it's been great support, and it's also been a really good way to hone my cooking skills and also to learn more about nutrition. So tonight we're going to talk about gut health. And I know I'm feeding you first, and then we're going to talk about bacteria in your lower intestine. I'm a nurse. I talk about gallbladders before the main course, so uh, just bear with me. So, you know, whenever we do presentations, they ask you who's paying, so I had to say that nobody's paying me to say this stuff. And I found really fun cartoons, and I love this one. I'm into natural foods, Joe. Give me a martini with a soybean in it. So what we're basically going to talk about is the colonies of bacteria in our intestinal tract and really all over our body. And we have probably eight times more bacteria in our body than we have cells. So there's bazillions and bazillions of them. And they really share our lives with us and there's a host and there's a host experience going on here. But most importantly is that we get good bacteria in our GI tracts, all the way from our front tooth to the rest of the story. And they set up a biofilm, and it's like little webbing. They set up these little webs, and they help protect the intestinal lining so the intestines can do what they're doing. So the bottom picture here is actually of that biofilm. And we want that to be a healthy biofilm because that helps digest our food, and gets the nutrients to our cells. And what we're talking about with these programs is what we call a nutrient-dense whole food diet. And so we want to get every bit of those sprouts that are in your salads tonight. We want to get every bit of the antioxidants from the pomegranate seeds. And without that healthy biofilm, it just kind of goes the way of the next flush. So, you know, the American diet, we call it the standard American diet. And the acronym for that is SAD, and it really is. So what does this high-fat diet really do? Well, first of all, excess fat in our diet increases the permeability of that biofilm. And so if you think of it like a screen door, it can have big holes like a garden webbing, or it can have little tiny holes like your finest strainer. And if it's got the big holes, you're going to get bad bacteria in there, and you're not going to get nutrient absorption. And fat actually degrades that permeability. Then what I happens? Have a question. Yeah. Is, it, is there any distinction between animal fat and plant fat? All fat. All fat. All fat. All fat. We'll do this. Right. And so then when that starts to break down, then we start to get unhealthy bacteria that compete 
within the intestine. And that also decreases the nutrient absorption. And then finally, the healthy bacteria begin to grow off. And that's when we start to get some of these pro-inflammatory states that we talk about. So anything that's an autoimmune disease, cardiac disease, type 2 diabetes, even some thyroid disease, many of these things are pro-inflammatory. The body is in a state of inflammation and can't function correctly. So this is just a little schematic of the good guys and the bad guys. The good guys are red, or the bad guys are red, and the good guys are green. And so when you have enough good guys, they're going to completely fill up those receptor sites, and the bad bacteria will go on through. So have you ever heard of people who all go out to dinner, and two of them get food poisoning, eating the same thing, and the other guys don't? And that's about the gut permeability. That's completely about gut permeability, that they don't have enough resident healthy bacteria to ward off the salmonella and whatnot. So some of you, if you've seen alternative providers especially, may have heard something called the leaky gut syndrome. And this sort of illustrates what it's doing. In the healthy digestive tract, there's that lovely barrier of, micro, of the biofilm and the nutrients can pass through there very easily, and the bad stuff just floats on down the stream. But in a leaky gut, that barrier is irritated, inflammation, again, and that membrane is disrupted so that the nutrients are not absorbed. And so what we want to do is get back to the picture on the left. So what causes leaky gut? The standard American diet, of course. Also alcohol. Overuse of steroids, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, aspirin. All of the, the non-steroidals are great. They're a great pain reliever. I mean, most of us know Motrin in, intimately. But a continuous use of it starts to break down the stomach lining, and there's a biofilm there that needs to be replenished. Um, also, steroids. Some of the people I see who have chronic asthma, and they're so, they've been on steroids for their whole life, they don't digest their food at all. And then they end up with irritable bowel syndrome, which is another inflammation on top of the asthma. The, the biggest reason for leaky gut, though, is an imbalance in the biome and a loss of that microfilm um, that happens. Also parasites. So this one I just found and I was so excited. Nature, October 2014. <laughs> Um, Non-caloric artificial sweeteners not only raise your blood glucose level, but they also alter the function and composition of your gut bacteria. Another reason to step away from the soda. I haven't had a soda in probably 10 years now, and I can't even think about a Coke. Because this is really what they are. Let's tell, let's tell the truth. Obesity, cavities, diabetes, allergies, cravings. All of these things are fostered by soft drinks, especially diet. <clears throat> Heart disease. So one of the factors, and there are many, but I couldn't get into the whole cardiology thing in 20 or 30 minutes tonight. But most animal, animal products, meat especially, contain high levels of a nutrient called carnitine. But carnitine is also atherosclerotic, which means it fosters the development of plaque in the arteries which causes occlusions, which is heart disease. It gets converted into other inflammatory chemicals that will actually promote um, heart disease and, and coronary blockage. Okay. Yeah. Does that include fish? Yeah, all animal products will do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're not, you know, I'm convinced that these teeth mean we're, we're, we're vegetable eaters. Um, if you ever look at a cat or a dog, I think of, Marjorie's cats, they got some serious teeth going on. They're, they're big incisors. Those are meat grabbers. We have blunted incisors over time, and that's really more of a, of a, of a vegetarian profile. So I love this one, and I sent this to my ex-husband. So you have two choices. We could perform triple bypass surgery, where we take a vein out of your thigh and open up your chest, and sew that vein into the coronary artery. It costs $100,000, and it will keep you laid up for at least two months. Or we could put you on a vegan diet. And the guy says, a vegan diet? Gee, that seems pretty extreme. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So if we look across the, the spectrum of chronic health problems, the ones that cost us a tremendous amount of money for our health care and our lifestyle, all of these are probably related in some way to chronic inflammation and decreased gut health. Um, I have a patient right now who um, I saw him two and a half weeks ago. He drives a truck for a living. He's a spouse of an MAU employer, employee. And he is status post bypass surgery. He's already had gastric bypass. He was 390 pounds when he had gastric bypass. He got down to about 220, and now he's 280. And so we had this come to Jesus meeting at our first appointment. And he went home that night, he watched forks over knives, he said, we cleaned the cupboards the next day and now I eat kale in the truck when I drive to the canyon. <laughs> and he's lost 13 pounds in two weeks. He's have, already lost that weight. Have you seen that guy, on, he's on his Facebook page, he's the trucker that uses the Instant Pot as he travels? Yeah, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think Joe Cross, Joe Cross has another trucker who carries his juicer with him in the truck. Yeah. So all of these things really come back to gut health. And it's not just what we're eating, but how it's absorbed into our bodies. Recognize this guy? He's sort of the patron saint of junk food. So there's a wonderful book out. If you see it at Bookman's or you're interested, it's called The Hungry Planet. Um, Peter Menzel is the author. And this is a wonderful photo essay of diets around the world and how economics play into all of our diets. You're going to get the slides in the email, so you're good. So let's start in Mexico. And I was in Mexico last spring. I had the best time of my life. Look up here. And look at the sugar. And there's all, these, all this processed food. And here's some more sugar here. Now, they have a pretty good diet rich in fruits and vegetables. And honestly, as being plant strong, I didn't have any trouble eating in Mexico. Um, the caterer that provided food for our group, it was all vegan. It was amazing. Sometimes there was oil in it, but um, for the most part, it was a very healthy diet. But where's the beans? Ones, huh? Where's the beans? There's no beans. I know. I said, unless there's something like hiding underneath the table down here. But there's a lot of good fruits and vegetables, but then there's, this is what really bothered me. And this is all beer here. But there's no beans. You're right. And usually you see that. What's one of the biggest populations with a problem with obesity and diabetes? Our Hispanic friends, along with our Native American friends. In China, and I thought this was really interesting, there's a lot of vegetables here. There's rice. There's vegetables here. But this is soda, all right here. And we know that people who uh, live in the Far who are born and raised in the Far East, do really well in their native diet, fish and vegetables and rice. And when they come to this country and start eating crab, they come down with all the same diseases. Yes? You were talking about bacteria earlier mm -hmm. and healthy bacteria. You find when traveling to other countries that there are other countries healthy bacteria is different than the healthy bacteria we have? I think so. And when I went to Mexico, because I was in a remote fishing village for about nine days, I took probiotics every day. Um, and I had no trouble with water or food, and some of the people in our group did. Um, and I just kept up on Culturel and took it twice a day, and I was fine. Um, the village we were in had a water purification plant, so you only could use the water. But, you know, you don't even want to get water in your mouth when you shower and you brush your teeth with it. So, but I do think there are different bacteria. We know in parasitology, that there are parasites in this world that we've never experienced and can't even diagnose. I worked with a friend who had been in Peru and came back with some bizarre bacteria that nobody here could actually treat because we didn't know what it was. And he actually had to go back to the University at Lima to be treated. And he's doing okay now, but it was a long couple of years that he was really suffering with gastrointestinal parasites. And we couldn't identify. They're probably in the same genus and species, but there's going to be little environmental differences. I love this one. Here's South Carolina. <laughs> now, uh, not only is there the wall oak chips over here, but up here is Capri Sun, Coke, and Budweiser. There's a little bit of vegetables right here. <laughs> there's coffee mate, there's soda, 
there's pizza, and look at all this meat. Pork. Pork, probably. Yep. Yep, absolutely. The South, and then when we talk about plant pure nation, we'll talk about um, food deserts, but um, the South is one of the areas with the worst food deserts where people cannot get other things than processed food. Here's Texas. And again, we've got a bunch of Capri Sun. There's a lot of water here, which is pretty good. We've got a few more fruits and vegetables. We've got a lot of meat. We've got a lot of processed foods. And of course, we have pizza, because that's the American way, right? I love pizza. Now we make our own. This is a plant-based diet. This is in Guatemala. There is a bottle of juice back here, and there's a couple packages there of something. But you've got all sorts of wonderful vegetables here, rices and beans and potatoes. That's plant, that certainly is more plant-based. So in terms of healthy or unhealthy bacteria, if we look at the standard American diet that's high in processed foods, something in a box. Michael Pollan says if it's made by people in white suits, don't eat it. If it comes from a factory, leave it alone. Um, but it's high sugar, high fat, and we get less diversity in our gut bacteria then, and therefore we're prone to more inflammation. If we look at a whole food, plant-based, nutrient-dense diet, we're gonna get a variety of carbohydrates. I'll talk in a minute about what you've been served tonight, and that's got some carbs in it, but they're healthy and they're dense carbs, they're complex carbs, and so the body really um, processes, them, processes, them, processes them in a whole different way. And this gives us a healthier intestinal lining, and then it also gives us better bowel function. You knew I had to get to poop at some point, okay? <laughs> so, what do we do if we're deficient, and how can we increase the good vibes? There's a lot of good ways to do it, and they're very, very simple. Number one is go outside and play. Now, I have to tell you, I'm a very proud grandmother of twins, and I never do a presentation without sneaking in a picture of my grandkids. <laughs> So this is Alex and Avery, and you can see Avery down here. This is the dirt girl. If there's a mud puddle within a block, she will find it. And she loves to sit in the mud and play with the mud, and she gets it everywhere. She's probably got her share of mud in her life. Um, and Alex is the same way. And here they are this year. This was this summer. Um, they live right next to a park, and so mom and the kids are out, and. She was eating sand that day. You know, she said when she brushed her teeth that night, there was grit in her teeth, but Avery didn't care. But just being outside, being in the forest, being in the desert, you're going to pick up um, airborne bacteria that are really, really healthy. So don't be afraid to get outside and get dirty. When I was preparing this, I thought about when my son was little, this, these kids' daddy, and we had some friends who had a daughter who was two months younger than my son. And so we spent a lot of time together as young families with small children. We could do play dates and we could babysit for each other. <clears throat> and I was a pretty lax, lackadaisical mom and my son teethed on milk bones and was out in the dirt. We had a, a sliding door from the kitchen to the patio on the same level. He was in and out all day. He was out there with the dog, digging in the dirt, probably eating half of it. And he actually didn't have his first cold or ear infection until he was after over two, almost three. She, on the other hand, was one of these spotless homemakers who had Cloroxed the whole world. All of those kids, and two more followed, are obese. They all have multiple food allergies. Um, they had horrible acne. And today, and these kids are now, my son's 38, so they're probably 38, 36, 35. They're all in terrible health. And I really wonder sometimes if it was her housekeeping. Her house was great. I mean, we had a lot of fun there. But she was, like, sterilizing anything. You know, I'd run the pacifier under the, under the sink and go here. You know, the five-second rule. Um, <laughs> and these kids are the same way. And they eat the dog food. And one day, Avery dumped all the dog food down the heater vent. So they like dog food. But they love to play in the dirt. This was actually just last month. The Today Show had a really good story about how living on farms helps kids um, not get asthma. And it's the dust and the hay and the animal dander and everything. And if they're exposed early, 
they build up an immunity, and that's more of a healthy functioning than becoming allergic to anything with four legs that's fuzzy and likes to sit in your lap. So this is good, it's on their website. They also did a story about uh, antibacterial products. And I'm in healthcare, I wash my hands a zillion times a day. I'm amazed that I have skin sometimes after scrubbing so often. But so many people use antibacterial cleaners for everything. And that actually can reduce some of your healthy bacteria as well. So use them mindfully. Um, you know, if it's, if I am running from room to room and I don't have time to stop and really scrub, I'll grab it, but it's very, very rare. And I really rely on hot water, soap, and friction. Do you all know the ABC thing? Yeah. You should wash your hands as long as it tells you, as long as it takes you to say your ABCs. And then, then you get a good friction going, and that's really what erases the germs. How come the university uses those antibacterial salts? Oh, I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. They're on every wall, and that stuff is so drying, and that's another problem, is it dries the upper dermis. And then I get hangnails like crazy from that stuff. Yeah. I moisturize like crazy. Sometimes I just want to sit in Vaseline just to get some moisture back in my skin. Oh, well, there's something cheaper. The soap and water. Yeah. yeah. Right. Fill up yeah. the soap yeah. dispensers. It's just so much cheaper. Why do you use it? It's not. Yeah. And those dryers, yeah. those have a lot of gunk in them too. I don't like those. I'll go grab toilet paper to wipe, to wipe my hands instead of using an air dryer. Really? Because you're not touching anything, is it? It's still, yeah. You know, the older ones that were the nozzle, those, those they would culture tons of bacteria out of that nozzle. I'm not sure what they've cultured out of the hot air ones, but I still don't trust them. Which brings up the five second rule. And if any of you are parents, you know the five second rule. If it fell on the floor, you know, you pick it up, dust it off, the five second rule. But it really depends on what you drop and where you drop it. If I drop something on my kitchen floor, I know that that's a clean floor and I'll pick it up and keep using it. If it's an ice cream cone on the main food aisle at the county fair, <clears throat> not so much. So, you know, just use your noggin. Okay, filtering water. This is something that's gone back and forth many, many times with people. And I really think filtering our water is very important. Just about 10 days ago, this was in the Daily Snooze, okay? City increases testing after water violation. And what they found was excessively high levels of chlorine. Now, I don't know where you guys live, but I live on the east end of Butler. Was that, was that citywide? Yeah. Because there was the, the one... Oh, the, no, this was more on the east side in my neighborhood. This, I'm on the southeast side at the end of Butler, yeah. and they said this one was from Enterprise to Fourth Street and Butler to the tracks. I think. And it was like one time out of ten, it exceeded the. Yeah. That's the one. That was the tested really, really high. I don't know about you, but I'm really sensitive to chlorine odors, and there are times I turn my kitchen sink on to wash dishes or fill up my fill up my filter. And I get this whiff of bleach. And that actually is a good antibacterial, but it also can be an antibacterial in your gut. So if you can pick up a Brita for 34 bucks at Target or Sam's for 29, I really think it helps. And I think it tastes better. And I've had filtered water in my home for years. What's in that land area that's causing that? I don't know, or is it in the treatment plant? where they use chlorine. They use chlorine to disinfect the water. But I really get some strange drifts from time to time, and it kind of makes me, really? I don't like it, so I filter. I, was in, I lived in California when the Loma Prieta earthquake happened in 1989. That was the one during the week of the World Series. And um, even though I was about 50 miles away from the epicenter of that, our water was still tainted for months. And so I started filtering water in 1989, and I just never gave it. It's an idiot of some But I think it's too sad. What do you think of the, like going to the like outside bashers or Walmart and pulling up the park gallery? Is that I would take a sniff. Those are purified and I don't know what their testing is. Okay. I mean I feel better if I just use tap water and a bread. I'm happy with that and I don't get the chlorine. Also I have filtered water in my fridge. And so that's what I drink and make coffee out of and not always in cooking, but it depends. If I turn on the tap and it's really chlorine, I will definitely use filtered water for cooking. 
Okay, eat fermented foods. That's another way. And you had a fermented dish tonight. What I serve for you is a tempeh um, lettuce wrap, although you got it as a salad because the iceberg lettuce was terrible at Sprouts this week. Um, and so we've got recipes for everybody. But anything that's fermented is going to help bring up, help foster more healthy bacteria. So here you've got one of my favorites, because I'm a German girl from Wisconsin, sauerkraut. Um, a lot of pickled vegetables, kimchi, if you like that, it's, too, it's a little too spicy for me. Kefir, now I have to admit, I haven't tried kefir um, or kombucha. There's something about kombucha with the mother in the bottom of the bottle that kind of makes me a little leery. But you can actually start kefir in water and use kefir water in cooking and for drinking. I thought kefir was dairy. There is a water starter. Um, a friend of mine, um, Sarika Cesaros, is an acupuncturist here in town, and she's really into cultured foods, and she makes a kefir water. Mm -hmm. And I need to find out more. And she did send me a link. There's a kefir water starter on Amazon, but I haven't looked into it. Here's one of my best excuses, is a little bit of sourdough bread from time to time. Um, sourdough bread comes from culture, and not enough is destroyed in baking to really harm you. And then finally, miso. And I love miso. I use it in soups and stews. It's a paste, and it's in the refrigerated section, and it's salty, and it's a great seasoning for a lot of dishes. So probiotics are the bacteria and the yeast that live in harmony with our bodies and that are really beneficial. So there's 10 times more probiotic bacteria than we have cells in our body. There's lots of ways to get them. You can get them through food, which is my preference. You can also take them, um, like Culturel or any prebiotic from, or probiotic from the store. And be careful, you want high dose and you want a lot of lactobacillus GG. That's a mother bacteria and it fosters the growth of other good ones. Prebiotics is something else. Prebiotics are good. They are the undigestible carbs that the healthy bacteria feed on. So when you eat them, you're, you're keeping your gut healthy. You can get prebiotics as a supplement. There's one called inulin, and there's another one called fructooligosaccharides. But I would really do it under the direction of a nutritional counselor because you get really gassy out of them and they have to be titrated. <laughs> I've tried several. I speak from experience. But you can also get them from these foods. And if you're, if you're a uh, survivor of the uh, winter or of the G-bomb study, some of the G-bombs are already in here. And they really do help. That undigestible part, portion of the carb actually feeds your gut bacteria. So here's some other ideas for um, probiotic and prebiotic foods. And this, this slides will go off to all of you. You don't have to write these down. So here's tempeh right here, and that's what was in your salad tonight. That's a marinated tempeh, which is a fermented soybean. And you buy it in the grocery store, and I crumble it. And it's like little, you notice they look like little beans. In fact, I think Stephen said lentils. Yeah, it's not lentils, it's actually soybeans that are fermented. And then um, I added, there's onion in there, and there were seeds in there, there's pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds in there, so you got your seeds. Um, and then there were some sprouts and tomatoes, so you're getting a really well-balanced flavor. So really, it's good food, healthy gut. I love Ganesha. Ganesha is one of my favorite characters in Indian mythology, so I had to bring him along. He's the remover of obstacles, so that's kind of fitting for what we're trying to do here. And you've all heard this quote, but I like this cartoon. So it's a pharmacy, and the pharmacist is saying, take one a day with tomato and cucumber. <laughs> That's what they all should be doing. So this one was up, I think, on the, on the um, Plant Pure Nation website, and I love this. What my grandma, th oops, what my grandma thinks I eat, a pea. What my coworkers think I eat, that's my problem, because they always see me in the sprouts in my mouth. This is tofu. What meat lovers think I eat, complete with the dirt. <laughs> but what I really eat are some really delicious meals that we provide recipes and can help you learn how to cook. And then this is one of my favorite cartoons. This is the dawning of the age of the <laughs> <laughs> So 
So what I prepared for you tonight is called a tempeh lettuce wrap, but again, I served it as a salad. It's very versatile. And I started with the tempeh, and then I marinated it all day in a big bag, in my car, in a cooler, in something called tamari, which is generally a wheat-free soy sauce. It's not as salty, but it really adds some flavor to it, because tempeh is kind of bland. Um, and then I added a green onion, cilantro, seeds or nuts, and then I added the lettuce. And you can put pickles in this, you can put olives in it. Pomegranate seeds were on top from my brother's bushes down in southern Arizona. And so you can make this like, if you liked egg salad before you gave up dairy, <laughs> Um, you can make this like your egg salad with pickles and onions and olives and anything you want. And then the sauce is actually a tofu mayo. And for that, I use these little boxes of tofu. You can get them at Sprouts and they're shelf stable for several months. Um, lemon juice, mustard, white pepper, a little bit of salt. And I did put some dill in it because dill is one of my favorite flavors. And then I put the zest of two lemons and the lemon juice in there and just whisked it up in the food processor. So questions? Yes, Michael. Can, can we, Jeff? Can we, can we have seconds? Yes, please help yourself because I'll be eating it all weekend. So please help yourself. Seconds or thirds, take a big scoop. Do you want to talk at all about acidophilus powders, capsules, where that fits into the whole big picture? I know ideally we're, we're just a food. It should be the food. Thank you. Right. Of, of, commercial, of commercial products, the one I like the best is called Culturel. And the cheapest place to get it is Sands Park. And the reason I like it is because it's super high colony count of Lactobacillus GG, which as I said is a mother bacteria and it supports all the other healthy, happy bacteria. You can go to Sprouts and Natural Grocers and Whole Foods and spend a fortune on um, all of these. But basically, if you're going to get one from a health food store, it should be one of the ones that is either shelf stable and still alive, um, not the cheap Target brand or the Walmart brand, because those are dead. Those aren't going to do you any good. But you want to have one that has active bacteria with a high colony count and most of it lactobacillus GG. The powders, I don't think are that effective. I think they're mostly prebiotic. I think they're that undigestible carbohydrate that kind of help the bacteria grow. But once they're freeze-dried or processed in a lot of ways, you're going to lose a lot of potency. Culturel is the one brand that doesn't lose a lot of potency in processing. And then, someone's on a dose of uh, antibiotics. Take probiotics, yes. With, at the same time? At the same time. Um, I suggest this to all of my patients at the health center that if they're on antibiotics, they need to be on probiotics. And of course, poor college students don't want to pay 17 bucks for a month's worth of culturel. And I say, well, you know, do you eat, do you eat um, yogurt? And if, if push comes to shove and they're still milk drinkers and they're not whole food, I tell them to go get a good organic cultured yogurt. And that will supply a lot of lactobacillus and acidophilus in it too. Yeah, I tell them all that when I put them on amoxicillin for their strep throats, which is what we see a lot of. Yes, what about, uh, you, you said you don't use fat, like uh, avocados, and peanut butter, olive Okay, oil. fats. I don't use processed fats, which are the oils and the solid shortenings. But the good fats that we need in our diet are the avocado, the nuts, um, and the plant-based. Usually avocado and nuts are, are my main fats. And I can eat a lot of avocado. Yeah, I mean, they're really good for you, but I don't use butter. If I need butter for something, I'll use a little bit of Earth Balance, which is a vegetable spread, but very little. You know, one stick lasts me, could last me months, because I don't use it very often. But every once in a while, you need it for a little browning or something, and I'll use just a tad, but um, I really don't cook with fat. I don't saute in fat. It's very, very rare. So you don't pan fry? No, you can saute in water or broth, and that's how I've sautéed things for years. It works beautifully. So, just to take that first, no, no olive oil? I own it, and I actually made some roasted potatoes, and I wanted the seasoning to stick on them, and I just put olive oil in my clean hands, and rub it around, and then I just rub the potatoes. And so that's probably not even a tablespoon, but it's enough to make seasoning stick to vegetables that you're going to roast. 
in my former life, I would put all the veggies in the Ziploc bag and pour about a half a cup of olive oil in there and shake them and turn them and then put all that on the cookie sheet, but I don't anymore. And most of the time, I now use broth. And I just found a recipe on pork silver knives that I'm going to try that uses a broth to make the seasoning stick to vegetables. Because I love roasted potatoes and roasted vegetables. What's a good temperature to roast at this altitude? About 400. Yeah, mushrooms don't do real well, but you can put them in last. <laughs> but as far as potatoes and any starchy vegetable, 375 to 400, usually they'll get the job done. Cool, did everybody get a recipe? We have plenty of copies. Jay, I'm going to turn it over about studies and good stuff here. Just watching me spill it all over the table. My kids can show me how to do it. Yeah, no, our kids show us all over the time. Forks over knives.